You're watching The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler at your mom's house. Welcome back to The Honeydew, y'all. We're over here at Studio Jeans doing it at your mom's house. I'm Ryan Sickler. Ryan Sickler on all social media, ryansickler.com. Make sure you sign up for my uh, email blast over there at the website. The website for this show, thehoneydewpodcast.com. That's where all the merch is. That's where everything uh, Honeydew related. You can find that there. And as I say every week, and I mean it sincerely, thank you so much for the emails, the messages, all the positive love you throw at this show. I really do appreciate it. I'm glad it's making a difference in so many of your worlds. Uh, it's doing the same for me. So uh, if you don't know what the show is, I call it, we're highlighting the lowlights over here. I say these are the stories behind the storytellers. And it is a pleasure to have this guest on. First time here on The Honeydew, ladies and gentlemen, Dan Soder. Hey. Hey. Thank you. Good to be here. I've been dude. wanting to do this for a long time. Man. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm glad. I'm glad. I don't ever get out to LA. So when I did, I was like, I have to do the Honeydew podcast. Thank you so much. I have to uh, come say what's up and hang out. And yeah, dude, it's been. They got you running around like crazy. I know. It's crazy. That. It's crazy. But I always trust a man with a band aid on his finger. So I know we're going to have a good talk. That's a good solid band aid. Right? I, I usually band-aid. don't wear band aids, but I was carrying a Christmas tree into my place and I scraped it along the concrete wall. And that <sighs> one, it went, it's pretty deep. I really do, though. I think yeah. I always have conversations with people with band-aids on their fingers sometimes i just like to tape up too dan you dude know I'll, I mean? I'll, go I just full, come I'll go full <laughs> macho man fingers on people i'll go walking around you taped up yeah. just tape it up bro you go, you dude, why know. do you have full boxer hand tape and you go cut me cut my tape off at the end of my girlfriend i'm like cut my tape off and i just have a conversation with that how the day went as well, she cuts my gloves and tape she goes off. how did the day go i went pretty good I went, oh hold on uh, uh, <laughs> cutting it off i'm like yeah well i I'm especially looking forward to this unfortunate conversation we're about to have. <laughs> yeah, what a great way to say uh, that. But before we begin, will you please promote everything you want? I know you got the special coming out right now, so please. Yeah, the special HBO Hour special, Son of a Gary, came out uh, December 7th. And congrats on that, by the way. Thanks, because man. before there was Netflix. I mean, this was it, man. And this if you is where see you it, would see Carlin and you know the monsters. I'm so saying, uh, you. if you watch it, just at least if 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 you don't want to watch the whole thing, just at least watch the beginning to see that classic intro because it's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. I was pretty hyped on the intro. Um, but yeah, Son of a Gary streaming now, HBO Go, HBO Now, uh, The Bonfire, Monday through Thursday, six to eight p.m. Eastern on Comedy Central Radio, Sirius XM ninety five, Dansoder.com for tour dates. San Francisco, Boston, bunch of cities up. Go to dancer.com and get all those tour dates. And then at Dan Soder on social media. That's awesome. Yeah. Great. Um, so this is really, you being here is just hitting a, a, a point. We were talking about this before uh, in my life because this year is 30 years since my dad passed. Yeah. And I think it was Thursday, what was Thanksgiving was uh, the 27th, I think. Yeah. It was the day he died 30 years ago. And... I was in a, I'm in a really good, cause I, I thought, man, my God, you're a child at 16 Yeah, dude. to be, to find your dad dead in his bed and think 30 years from now, you're going to be just fine. I'm looking at my daughter. I'm looking at my stepson. We had the best Thanksgiving together. Um, and then I went and got a Christmas tree and for her mom's house and I was for her mom's house <laughs> and I was, uh, decorating it. On that was the day my dad was buried. So he died on the 27th, buried on my brother's 13th birthday, by oh, the way, on November man. 30th. Yeah. Oh. Um, and we're, I'm put her on my shoulders to put the star on the tree and stuff. And she just looks at me. She gives me the biggest fucking hug. And I was like, man. Yeah. I and, and to think how great I felt at that moment. And 30 years ago to this day, we yeah. were closing the lid literally on my dad. And I was like, wow. So how did... How did they, uh, just a quick question, how did they shift from burying your father to your brother's you presence? Yes. Yeah, I'll tell you exactly Very how. much so. It, was, it wasn't much of a shift. Yeah. Like, how do you just being like, That's he was I, a good day, man, happy to, birthday. <laughs> That's exactly to, what fucking happened. Just everyone's like, oh, man. All, was, also, here's a Nerf gun. Yeah, just, by the way, here's some toys. Yeah. It was the literal funeral. And then we went back to my grandmother's row house in Baltimore for yeah. a, for the wake. Yeah. And at the wake, 
you know, after about an hour of it, they were like, you think it's good now? And they brought a fucking cake out with candles. If and said, I Happy were birthday. I, I telling you, this is what happened. If I were in the room, right? If I was in the room 30 years ago when that happened and they were like, what do you think of this? I wouldn't have looked at you. I would have looked at your little brother and I would have gone, he's going to front the most dangerous metal band <laughs> of all time. There's nothing more metal than having your birthday at your dad's funeral. That was it, dude. I, could, like, I was like, we couldn't it. wait a day. And we couldn't like, wait. He's still here. We could wait yeah. till December 1st. They're like, yeah. how, did you, how do you write the lyrics in Satan's penis? <laughs> and he goes, I, uh, I buried my father and then I opened up a, a Where's Waldo book. <laughs> I unwrapped the Where's Waldo set. Uh, they really did that. I yeah, was like, who was in charge of nuts. this shit? They did that. That is nuts. They felt like they could not pass his birthday the up, only w- even though. I, and I was just like, good. We could have done it. We could have waited a day. You know what's funny about that? And, and the and the parallel that it has with me. Um, you said it was 30 years and we were talking about this. Yeah. I just hit 20 years of my sister being dead. My sister <sighs> got See, killed. I didn't know about that. I yeah. know about your dad. Yeah, yeah, my dad, which is, you know, there's like jokes on, on the special about it. But my sister, my dad died in 97, and then my sister died two years later. And she was my dad's, she was my half-sister with my dad. So she was 12 years older. She was like the sister that got me through all that stuff. Really the only person in my life that I could look to and absolutely trust, 100% trust, was my sister. So you were how old when your dad died? I was 16. I was 14 when my dad died. And she was how old? She was 26. Okay, so there's a little gap there. Yeah, okay. and she was older. She was like, the you know, she was very uh, shepherding. And very like uh, you know, funny. We'd always be funny around me, so we could be funny around it, and that kind of always broke the tension. And then my sister died October 29th of '99, and uh, it was a Halloween party. Oh. I found out because she died the 29th, and then on the 30th, I went with my friend to his sister's house party in Boulder at University of Colorado because I grew up in Denver. I grew up in Aurora, and we um, we went up to the University of Colorado, and it's so funny to watch people be like in masks and stuff like it's a spooky night and you're like no 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 fuck you guys i just i just my sister just got crushed on i-10 you hear something yeah scary? yeah you want to hear something scary my fucking sister got hit from behind on oh i-10 and fucking God. killed what happened so my sister uh my sister was driving my sister lived she grew up in riverside she grew up out here okay out here yeah out here in riverside and um she was going to i believe dana point they had a mm-hmm. vacation home her mom had a vacation home in dana point and uh she was on I-10 on an exit ramp, and I believe there was like a road rage. Like two guys were kind of getting into no. it. And one guy forced another guy off the like off onto the exit ramp, and it was backed up. And he came in too fast and rear-ended my sister. And she had a two-seater truck, and her her uh, seat folded back and hit her head. Oh, and then she died instantly. Instant. I oh. think yeah, and that was the story. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That's oh awful, man, it sucks. Man. Jesus Christ! And but she it, was how old? 20, she was 28. 28. She was, I was 16. She was 28 when when uh, when she died. But she um. So in two in the span of two years, you lose your dad and your sister, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus that is Christ, fucking dude. dark. That it, is beyond dark. And it's one of those things where you said like at 16, you know, you're having this moment with your daughter. I've had a couple of those moments in my life where I've been like. The, the thing that makes me sad is wishing that I could talk to them about that moment. Yes. Like uh, when I did Conan, I did Conan twice and I didn't really think about it. But then I was like, man, if Michelle was still alive, she would be here because she lived in Riverside. So I just be like, yo, come up. Yeah. Come up to Burbank. I'm doing fucking Conan. And so I think about that. And then when the HBO special, I kind of like thought about it after I taped. You know, like, oh man, there was a couple people I, I kind of wanted their opinion. I think my dad, I think my dad would have liked the jokes about him in my special. Yeah, because I make fun of him being an alcoholic and dying as a Jimmy Buffett fan. That's what he wanted. <laughs> That's the best way to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I said cirrhosis is I'm going the out on top. Yeah, I said cirrhosis is the parrot head way out. <laughs> it's the fucking way to go. But it is like one of those things where you you start uh, you start wondering like, ah, what would they be like if they were here? You know, I think about Michelle all the time as I'm 36 now. She would be 48. She'd be a mom. She'd, she'd probably have all this, like, different opinion. And I always really valued her opinion. She had a very strong opinion about everything. But it was always fair and, like, cutting. You know those people that are so honest that you're like, who fuck, oh, fuck, you're right. getting in there. Yeah. That's how she was about everything. So it was, it was uh, yeah, she was a person that when I lost – 
you kind of at 16 just throw up your hands and you're like, well, fuck all this. I just started getting fucked up. Yeah. You I just started angry, getting fucked up. Everything. Yeah. Dude, the anger. What's crazy is I was always like, I'm not angry. I'm not an angry guy. And then you get to your mid-20s and you're like, hey, I just, I'm just punching shit for losing at NCAA college football. <laughs> I'm like, I put my hand through a fucking table. You're like, we had to separate some people. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know losing to Ball State was gonna make me fucking karate chop this fucking coffee table. But you start getting angry, and then I, uh, I was always a really fun drunk. I was always like, when I was drunk, I was like fun and you know wanting people around, wanting to buy stuff. And then uh, I quit drinking when I was twenty nine, and it was like at the end you started seeing that anger start to come out when I would drink. I just started getting real chippy, like trying to talk shit, just be like fuck you. And then I was like. You got to get into therapy, pull the drink. You know, I got into therapy and then that helped me quit drinking and then just all that. But then now going, you know, people, I don't think when I was 16, I realized how much work was going to need to be done oh. in my 20s and 30s to have an assembly. PS 40s. Yeah. I just let you know. Oh, dude, I'm looking. I'm, I'm hoping that's when the clouds. I'm looking. I'm hoping that's when the clouds clear up. I just Dr. Drew just recommended this new ther therapy to me that I started. What's going it called? To. It's uh, EMDR. Yo, it's so EMDR. Mm -hmm. Check this shit out. 16 year old Dan Soder sister gets killed. Uh, I'm smoking fucking blunts, just fucking. Yeah, I didn't do anything doing, till I was 21. Oh, weed, dude, I'm, weed. I I'm drank. doing fucking uh, gravity bong hits, fucking bong rips before school. I'm getting fucked up, smoking cigarettes. I start drinking, just fuck. Just my mom can see it. My mom's like giving me my distance, but she, I'm getting fucked up. It was called EDM, EMDR. Mm -hmm. She's like, listen, I want you to get into therapy. She's like, I really think you need therapy. And she's like, there's this new Denver University is trying this new EMDR thing. Wow, all right. Where you're it's for trauma. Mm -hmm. And they and it's kind of to what it does is it's supposed to you're supposed to carry the trauma in your frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. And dude, I'm going off what I remember at 16. So I haven't You're read right. It. And what they do is they use the therapy to kind of jar that loose so you can process it back. Therefore, you can start getting all your thoughts back in a normal way. That's right. Am I right? You're right. And, and there is an end to it, which is great. It's not a talk therapy, which is what they refer to as regular therapy. No, you, you sit talk. and watch a light and you move your eyes back and forth. You do. Well, they have that. You can do the finger or you can do alternating taps. There's, I did the as finger. As long as it's alternating. It's yeah. the alternating thing. And, and what it did for me was I, my daughter almost got hit by a car last December. Okay. And what that did was unlock trauma of... <sighs> of everything and everyone I know who cared about me dying. Yeah. You yeah, know? And yeah. I didn't realize I had been just sitting on that for so long. Well, and it made me understand where it came from. Like you say, and, and then I started being able to, I started getting nervous about flying. Like, Oh, I could die on this. I started getting scared of heights. I was never scared of heights. Yeah, I mean, and it all goes back to what we're talking about right now. 16. People don't realize when, when that shit happens to you at 16, you slam shut the gate into you. Or at least I did. I slammed that shit shut and fucking welded it shut where I was like, ain't nobody getting in. Yeah. But then in my 20s, I started noticing, like, you got to pop that thing open. And then in therapy, I was, we kind of cut the concrete off. Mm -hmm. And then we got it up for a little bit. And you're like, whoa, 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 shit, shit's coming out. I'm in my 40s and yeah. somebody's just at the point where they're like, is anybody down yeah. there? Dude, it's like, a it missile goes, silo. You just open <laughs> in that silo deep, and you're like, bro. hello? It, it goes deep. Dude, and you don't realize how deep it goes because I think... People in this country, especially, um, I think it's getting better now with these with this current generation. But eighties, nineties, it was still that kind of like fucking get through it, walk yeah. through it, tough it out, walk it off, walk it off, yeah. just fucking walk that shit off. And I was proud of that for a long time. I was like, I'm walking this shit off. This this isn't. I went to school like the next day after my sister died, and people were like, what are you doing here? And I was just like, I'm fucking walking it off. And, you know, and you get to your twenties and you're like, damn, I'm. I'm in a lot of pain. And then you get to your 30s, and I was in therapy, and I was kind of like, oh, this is what's stopping me from allowing people in, allowing people in. This, that was like five years ago. And now I'm to the point where I'm in a great relationship. I love my friends, but there's still shit that creeps up where you're like, what's still going on? And you don't realize yeah. it's like, I try to say, man, when you have trauma in your teenage years, your house gets flooded. You're full on flooded. And you don't realize you got to pull up the carpets, you got to pull the floorboards because there's fucking rot and there's and there's there's shit in there that you don't want to clean out. But that's 
the work you have to do in order for you to have a clean house and for you to be able to live. And, and so, so, and also I want to say this to everybody listening out there. Therapy is, I, I say it all the time. It's so great for you. And just because you're in it, don't think like you say, things creep up all the time. Check this is check this out. So my father dies. We're 16. We move in with, cause my mom had already split. We live in an apartment where she comes home once a week. My brothers and I raise each other from 10th grade through 12th grade. Shit. We are out. We live with my dad's mom. In okay. a year and a half, she drops dead of a heart attack in oh. front of me. I'm giving her mouth to mouth. So you thing. found your dad and your grandmother. My little her. brother found him first, came yeah. and got us. Like, I think oh. dad's dead. We go in. My dad's dead. My grandmother dropped in front of us. I give her mouth to mouth. She passes. Her name's Carmela. Yeah. I never hear that name anymore. So this was right before, probably the week before Thanksgiving. I go to the grocery store. I go over to the deli. I don't even go to the deli much anymore. Yeah. I don't even know why I fucking went. Yeah. But I went over to get a half a pound of boar's head, low sodium, ham, sliced thin. <sighs> That's on. all I wanted. Come on. This lady With some yellow me. mustard? Right. What yep. are we doing That's what here? I'm talking about, bro. On a Martin's potato roll. <laughs> So this lady turns around. She goes, I'll be with you in a minute. I'm like, oh, this is an old Italian lady. My grandma's Italian. I'm like, this is great. She comes over. I tell her what I want. She goes, you have an accent. I go, I have an accent. Hey, what do you, I go, hey, I, all I said was no worries. You got it off of that. Where yeah, are you from? Fifle Mouse, where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I do see you today. You're, like, you're a fucking Disney cartoon. <laughs> hey, pot. Hey, boy. <laughs> you're a bowl of noodles. What are you fucking talking to me about? So, um. She's like, where are you from? I say, I'm from Maryland. She's like, oh, my daughter's in D.C. And she's having Thanksgiving in Maryland. She's a vegetarian. Guess what they're making? They're making pizza. Where are you going? I said, nowhere good. They're not going to have Italian food. All oh, you're Italian. Where are your people? And we start getting into it. My grandmom's people are from Abruzzo. My my mom's people are from Sicily. Yeah, you guys uh, are doing what I call Italian dirty talk. Yeah. If you ever see anyone with Italian dirty uh, like roots, they just fucking, that's how they talk dirty to each other. They're like, where are you from? They're like, North Italy. Like, well, oh, oh, where are you from? That's <laughs> what so she was like. Oh, oh rich people oh, there. She island. kept saying. What island? Like, they didn't come oh, over here. Oh, you have a seen the spring there? And you're like, shut up. Shut up. Irish people do it too. They're like, oh, I'm from fucking Cork, Ireland. And you're like, my father's from Dublin. Let's fucking mash our dicks to chat. Oh, fucking, oh, I love you. You, I love you. It's fucking. I'm, I mean, I'm rocking the Swedish shirt. We do that shit. Yeah. Everyone does that. But it's just funny to. But Italians love to do that shit. So I, I, you know, we get in this whole thing, and I tell her like, I didn't realize because my whole entire family was Italian. Mm -hmm. So anywhere I went, dad's side, mom's side, these sisters, these sisters, everyone had traditional food plus. Uh, some meatballs or a lasagna oh. or stuffed shells. The I best just, cuisine. Something. It's I the just best made cuisine. Things. I always make something Italian for the holidays because <sighs> I don't like just the Fuck. regular shit. When I found out Italians sometimes do lasagna at Thanksgiving, yeah. it's, it blew this white boy's mind. So the opposite of me, when I started, I'm telling her, when I started dating girls in high school, everyone's dead at this point. I go to yeah. somebody else's Thanksgiving and I'm asking, like, where's the lasagna? Like, yeah. What the fuck are you talking about? And that's when I realized, oh, it's our got it oh man so then i tell her i go hey i'm gonna go grab a few things can i she goes no stay here and talk to me so we talk for a little while longer small talk and at the end i go you're such a sweet lady what's your name and she goes carmella and i go i i i'm not even lying i tear up did you get hit well, <laughs> listen you, to me well first you get, you get hit with that it was like <gasps> yeah but i go well, cold I want, water did you say carmella she goes yeah carmella i go that's my grandma's name the lady i'm sitting here telling you about right now i can't yeah and I pull out my credit card to show her my business is Stella Carmella, my daughter, my grandmother. Yeah. She sees it and she's like, oh my God. I go, other than Carmella Soprano, yeah. I don't even know I hear that name that often. She's like, nope. And I couldn't believe that shit. And do you know I've been in that grocery store six or seven times since? I have not seen her once. What? And I never saw her before that. Yeah, I swear I, to you, that's fucking weird. It's but just, shit like that just but I think, gets I think, you no matter where you are. When yeah, you but I also it. think like... Um, on a positive side of that, like going through that makes you more aware of stuff like that. Like going, going through, like I was telling you, uh, my height, my middle school best friend and a kid I grew up with, um, my dad and I, the only thing we shared was the San Francisco 49ers. It was the only thing. Where, That's where like, he's from, right? Yeah, My dad's Northern from the California. East Bay, grew up, grew up Bay area, uh, lived in Marin, was just a diehard Niners fan. So it was like from the time I was, I was born in Hartford. It was like the time I was born 49er stuff. 49er stuff, 49er stuff. It's the one thing that we share. Whereas the, kind of the one thing where my parents had a messy divorce. 
I was kind of in the middle of them. You know, my mom would be like, you're not seeing your fucking dad. He's an alcoholic. So what age? Liar. Take us there. What age did they split? Five. Okay. You're young. Yeah. Yeah, I was young. And my dad moved to San Francisco. In fact, the Super Bowl that year was the Broncos 49ers. And my mom's family's from Denver. So she's a Broncos fan. Oh, man. So she has a Broncos <laughs> Super Bowl party. And her, and her five-year-old boy, six-year-old boy now, is rocking red and gold, running around. And the Niners put a beating on him. Yeah, it was like 55 did. to 10. Um, that was always one of my favorite stories. It just worked out that year because you know my dad lost custody but won the Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, you got you got to take the good with the bad. I don't have my son, yeah. but I got that ring. He goes, I got that. Woo, got that fourth one, <laughs> one for the pinky. Uh, <clears throat> so my dad and I, my dad would kind of come in and out of my life. You know, he's an alcoholic, and he he would uh, he would show up. He wouldn't show up. He would never show up. But he would call. And uh, ne- so throughout, did you play sports and stuff in high yeah, school? Yeah, I played, I played football from 11 to 17. I didn't play my senior year, but I played like sixth grade through junior year. And he would not show up there? Never saw that? No, never no. saw me. Uh, I don't think he saw, ever saw me play a baseball game. I don't think he ever saw me play any sports. Um, he always make that promise. Alcoholics are real good at promising. Things. Yeah. They're, they're real good. You know, it's like 20 men in their 20s talking dirty to women. with like, I'm going to fuck you all night. And like all night, alcoholic dads are like, "I'm gonna be there for Christmas. I'm gonna be there for your birthday." And you're like, "Ooh, I got a little league game." He's like, "I think I want to coach it." And you're like, "Oh, <laughs> like, oh fuck, oh fuck yes, dad, coach my fucking little league team." <laughs> so I, uh, he always talked that shit, but but you know, never came through. But the one thing that we could always talk that wasn't bullshit was Niners. We just call up and just be like, "Oh fuck, what's going on?" Like. I was at my grandma's apartment. He lived with my grandma, and I was at her apartment in Marin when they traded Montana to the Chiefs. Mm-hmm. So I remember that San Francisco Chronicle that said, like, Chief Joe on it. And I just remember, like, uh, you know, like, all that kind of shit. The Niners were, like, the one thing that we had that that uh, my grandmother and I have. You know, I, I watched the Ravens-Niners game at my grandmother's yeah. house in San Francisco. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's fun. I love old ladies that love sports and Yo. play cards. That's Dude, all, that's my all gra- we do. That's all Dude, my grandma, grandma That's all, all my grandma does. I love those ladies. Uh, she beat the brakes yeah, off me in gin rummy. Yeah. She's 92, and she <laughs> fucked my shit up. I beat her on the first game, and legitimately I was like, man, I think Nana's getting old. I don't think she can hang. And the next day, she hung. And for those of you that know Jen Rummy, she was up 445 to 81 on me. She beaten me. I don't care if you know Jim Rummy or not. 445 to 81 is an ass whooping in any that's event. An ass whooping. She was putting it on me. I fought back and got over 200, but fuck, she beat the shit out of me. And then I show up. And then I show up. Uh, that's hilarious. I, I had to drive down. It's a long drive from my grandmother's to San Francisco uh, to SFO. So I like pack so I can just watch the game with her and then I can just leave, you know, at the end of the game. And I come downstairs and my grandma is all night, just decked out Niners. And she's like, yeah, that's what I wear every weekend. And you're like, I love that shit. I love it. 92 years old. She just loves it. She just, she's into the, to the Niners and the, and the Warriors. That's what she loves the most, which breaks her heart. Cause I'm a Nuggets fan. Cause I like chose the Nuggets. Yeah. I, was like, I want a Denver team, but the 49ers are kind of just this thing on my dad's family that no matter what was going on, we could talk about the 49ers and that stopped the drama of not showing up for my birthday, not showing yeah. up for any sports games, missing Christmas presents, stuff like that. Yeah, being a dad. Being a dad. A responsible Doing dad. the actual work yes. of being a dad. Putting the time in. Um, but, you know, you talk about, like, <clears throat> you're seeing that lady Carmela, and it's something that you only realize because you lost your grandmother yes. that you realize that and that it's important to you. So uh, one of my best friends in middle school, Michael McDaniel, is just this, uh, you know, he becomes an NFL coach, and that's fucking great. Yeah, that's Or big. whatever. Uh, he was with the Atlanta Falcons as their receivers coach. I believe he was the receivers coach. And then they lose to the Patriots in the Super Bowl. And I thought he was going to get the offensive coordinator job because I knew Kyle was leaving. I knew Kyle was leaving. The, Kyle Shanahan was going to leave to take a head coaching job. <clears throat> I checked my phone. One afternoon, and I just have a text from McDaniel that's like, I'm a 49er. And I was like, what? And I knew Kyle got hired. That's Kyle. his childhood team too, right? No, he was a Broncos Oh, fan. he was a Broncos he, I was I was a 49ers fan growing up in Denver. Because of your dad. Because of my dad. Right. And it got was just it. like, dude, him and his mom, McDaniel and his mom growing up, diehard Bronco fans. 
I would wear my Niner shit over on Sundays, you know, and they'd be and his mom would be like, "You're wearing the wrong stuff. You got to be in orange and blue." Just joking around. Yeah. His mom Donna's the shit. She's the fucking best. Legitimately one of my favorite people. And um you know, there's like this weird thing where all of a sudden I'm like, "Man, my dad would trip the fuck out to know McDaniel is the right. run game yeah. coordinator." Of the San Francisco 49ers. Your dad would probably never leave him alone, want to talk to him all the Come it, over, come over. He'd probably be a better dad than him. <laughs> <laughs> he'd probably fucking he'd show up to his games. It's never too late. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, coming all I'm your coming games. To his games. Like, hey, fucking, of course you're going to his games. Uh, but it was one of those cool moments where it, that caught me where, um, you know, I felt like such an outsider the whole time. I, I think just in life, I kind of felt like an outsider. Yeah. And, which is very easy to do in life. But especially being a 49er fan in Denver and all this stuff. And then I went to uh, the Thanksgiving game a couple seasons ago, about three seasons ago, with the Seahawks 49ers. And I show up to McDaniel's apartment to meet up with his wife and his, uh, you know, his family to go to the game. And I walk in his apartment, and there's his mom standing there head to toe in Niner stuff. And I'm, I'm like, you finally got the right gear on. <laughs> That's and she was great, like, dude. She was like, it took me, it yeah, she was like, it took me 20 years, <laughs> but we did it. And I was like, come on. And it was. It was like 20 <laughs> years, you know. And so I think that that kind of stuff, but something that really affected me was, uh, you know, when you have, when people die in your life, you, you forget uh, how they move, how they talk. Oh, you're striking so many chords. A friend of mine just sent me a video of my grandmother. Yeah. And her on. voice. Yeah. It was slightly higher in that video than I remembered in my head. For sure. You know? But my dad's been dead since 97, so I don't remember his voice. My, yeah. But then you start having dreams about him. And uh, I, I don't have a lot of dreams about my dad, but then I had one recently where we were at my apartment in Queens and my dad is like rushing to get ready. That's all he's like. He's like hurried. And I'm like, dad, 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 chill, 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 chill. McDaniel's a coach. We're going to the game. Like it was like me setting him up to be like, wait till you see the access we have. And it was just kind of one of those things where I woke up and, but I could hear his voice in the dream. So when he talked, it was his voice. But then I woke up, I'm like, I don't remember what his voice was. Yeah. And that's the saddest shit where you're like, fuck, man. Like people now are, you got videos of everybody. Everybody's got a video. But if your parent died before 2000, good luck. I have photos, some photos. I got, Wait, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you something right now. Hold yeah. On. I got my phone right if it's a letter from my dad, I'm going to cry. It is. He's like, I'm sorry I missed your fucking just, Spartans football you're game. You're hitting so many <sighs> We lost 116 to zero. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's. Um, um, I feel like this generation now is going to be luckier because you're going to have videos of people. I want to read this to you. I, I just was on Brant Tober's podcast when I was out in Denver, and yeah. I, um, I read this, and this was a dream. I don't have dreams that often. I don't yeah. remember them that much. Me neither. This was. Two years before I had my daughter, so and I was going through some shit too. So this was, and I wrote it down. I don't ever do this either. This is a dream I had about my dad. Saturday, early a.m., April fourteenth, twenty twelve. So this is seven, seven and years, ago. years yeah, yeah. ago. All right. I dreamed. I, this is what I wrote. I dreamed I was piloting a helicopter, and my dad was sitting in the seat behind me in the same helicopter. We're flying together for a while. I didn't know what I was doing. I bounced hard off the ground a few times. I brought it back up. My dad's telling me how to control it like he knew. It was clear he had done this. You know those weird feelings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was clear he had done this before. Yeah, they have dream knowledge, which they definitely didn't like have in real life. At all. Yeah. I'm flying under overpasses, through traffic. Uh, I'm doing it, but I'm nervous. It was definitely my first time. And I look back at my dad, and my dad is now face down. I start yelling, Dad, Dad. And I don't know if he's dead. I, now, all of a sudden, I do a fucking loop. I yeah. get the helicopter back up. And I look over my right shoulder, and there's this other helicopter that's now flying up next to us. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I don't know what this helicopter's trying to tell us, but they're right next to us, parallel while we're flying, right? Now my father's awake, but now he's not speaking at all, and he's just pointing to them. Uh -oh. And our right side door of the helicopter is open, and their left door was. And I kept asking my dad, like, what do they want? But he didn't say a word. And I remember being nervous and scared, like we were in trouble, you know? It was real cloudy and dull, like smoky. Yeah. And I couldn't make anything out clearly, except that they were flying to our right, relatively close to us. And just as I'm about to make a move, I fucking wake up. And I wrote down, it's probably the answer to everything and nothing at fucking all. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. And I took it to mean later, like, 
I knew I wanted to be a dad. I knew I wanted to do these things. And it was like, you know, this ride over here is just crazy to fucking make the leap and go yeah. that way and see what's going on. That's what the, what I came to the conclusion. It was so crazy, man, is you don't realize. <clears throat> I never thought of myself as an anxious person. Me I either. never Man, thought God I smoke damn, a lot. I smoke a lot of weed. Me too. I'm pretty fucking low maintenance. I just I like you know I can get shit done myself. I don't really need to be taken care of. Me too. Man, my girlfriend's so great. We woke up one morning. She's like, "You're so anxious. Stop being anxious. You know, like you're wound up. You're wound up." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, you don't realize. It takes another person for them to say that. that but tension. when you're 16, yeah. you go into this mode where Everything. you're just like." Fuck, because you just got fucking popped. You just got popped by life. So you're just like, fuck, what the fuck? It's like if someone came in your room and just started beating the shit beating out of you. In the middle of the night. And you wouldn't sleep. <laughs> yeah, you you wouldn't sleep for ever. fucking weeks. Because you'd be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fucking just <laughs> That's your coming again. off yeah. the fucking pillow. And you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> but it is one of those feelings where it's like, now th through therapy. So when, so when my sister died when I was 16, that EMDR, uh, it was an experimental thing in Denver. Mm -hmm. And my mom, through her insurance and knew a couple of people, got me into a, a therapist that wanted me to do EMDR because it was fresh. My sister had died maybe six months before that. Man, I fucking blew that off. So I would just smoke so much weed and go into therapy and just be like, I don't know. There's a girl I like at school. And she'd be like, what about your sister dying? I'm like, I don't want to talk about that. What's up with Jeannie being a bitch? <laughs> it's like... <laughs> You're talking about stuff like that. Help you're me like, dissect that. Uh, uh, yeah. Why didn't she like me? I like her so much. Why didn't she like? And then, you know, now it's funny because now here we are, twenty, literally twenty years later. My sister died in '99, it's 2019, and you're seeing EMDR being like, this could really be the breakthrough. And you're like, fuck. It's like kind of like finding out someone came to you in the '90s and was like, you should invest in Apple. Google. Apple. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Put money in Apple, and you're yeah. like, fuck that. I'm a Mac, you know, like I'm a Mac guy. Compact Mac, Passario yeah. all the way, man. Dell, you're I'm getting a Dell, Dell dude. <laughs> you're getting a fucking Dell. And then you're like, son of a bitch. I had it right there. And I'm kind of interested to do it because I do believe whenever I have like a lot of um, intense moments or uh, especially during the taping of the HBO special because it meant so much to me and I put so much work into it. I went and did Edinburgh Fringe Festival and then, I, you know, it was like this leading up moment. It was in New York. I've never done a special in New York. I had family out. I had friends out. I had all these comics that I love coming out. And I just remember the headaches I would get would be right in mm. here, just right in the front lobe. And I was like, man, maybe I should have done that. Where you carry all that shit. Yeah, maybe I should have done some EMDR because whenever I have a good therapy session, it does feel like something like whoop, like one of the balls is like bloop. Like when I found out, when my therapist broke down the fact that he was like, you're angry because you're in pain. And you're like, fuck you. Fuck <laughs> you. I'm, uh, I'm crying at the yeah. deli counter. I'm like, <laughs> fuck you. What the fuck you mean? I'm fucking angry. I'm fucking, I'm fucking fight you. I'll fucking fight you. Uh, and, then he, and then I realized he was like, I used to have a, uh, my mom and I have a great relationship now, but we had a real tough one from when I was like 12 to 16. It was, I think it was a lot of anger. 12 to 17. I had a lot of anger towards her. And my therapist was like, yeah, yeah, you're just misdirecting your anger at your father, at your mom. She was the parent that was around. So that was the parent you could take it out on. And you're like, and then, it, then I call my mom and I'm like, I'm sorry. Fuck, I'm sorry. You were fucking awesome. They like, you know, wow. my bad. And it, it kind of just the thing with parenting. It's such a long game. Yo, Hopefully you, you hope you, you raise your kids in a way where they re hit that realization. You live long enough. Yeah. Because your dad's never going to get that call. No, my no, dad's no. never getting that Yeah, call. but my mom got that call like, yeah. fuck, lady, you did so much. But then it's also like, um, then I realized like, oh, I haven't been allowing people in. Like Big J, we're on the, we're on the radio show. And Big J's like, how come I never know your girlfriend's? How come you have girlfriends and Christine and I don't hang out with them? You know what I mean? Vecchione Owen hangs out with them because that, that's my roommate. And he said that. And for the first time in my life, I didn't take it defensively. I didn't take it like, well, fuck you. Why do I got to fucking? Because that was, that was my whole life. Like, fuck you. Why do I got to fucking share with you? Why the fuck do I got to? That's basically me being like, don't come in. Right. Don't come. But then... Again, it started happening about four years ago where I started starting to let stuff in and, and let stuff happen. And 
I was like, yeah, man. And my girlfriend now, we hung out with Jay. We hung out at uh, backstage at Nate, Nate Bargetsy did Town Hall. Yeah. And she and I were in the green room with like Jay and Veter and like a bunch of people. And I was like, oh, this is what it feels like. Like, this is what it feels like when your friends are friends with your girlfriend. And they're like, hey, come over here. You know, like, hey, we're going to take a walk. We'll be right back. You know, you're like, yeah, cool, whatever. And then the next day, he's like, man, she's the best. She's, you know, he's like telling you, like, he was telling me, like, dude, great. You got a great one. You know, she gets you. And, and it was, that was, that was a very rewarding feeling to be like, oh, oh, I don't have to prepare. I'm always preparing to get hit. I'm always like guard up. And you got to realize like that fucks life up. Yeah. Because you got to. I read a really interesting article. You can't be any more vulnerable than this. Than this. Just hands down to your side. And you're like, fuck, fuck. And I think there's like. Uh, you know, my therapist calls it future tripping. I love that term. Future tripping. We're always thinking about this and this and this and this. None of that's even happening. Yeah. None of it's even happening. But you're, you've had that argument in your head already. You've already thought out what you're going to say sometimes on. Or you thought about how this is going to go down. Like, even with the, I, I'm worried about this plane crash. And why? You're, we're sitting right here having a great conversation. What Dude, the fuck are you worried about that? Pl- it's future I trip. No, I, you know what? I'm having such a good time having this conversation with you right now. And I'm probably going to get a case of the flu in the next five years. So why fucking worry about it now? Exactly. I'm going to get diarrhea in the next three months. You might get it after that cough. I might, but, I might be yeah. slipping in a slide and all over <laughs> LA. But it... It really is, man. It's a it's a tough thing to learn because I think when you go through trauma as a kid, you go immediately into this fucking battle stance. You're in a battle stance. Well, you've just like, been, like you said, blindsided out of nowhere twice. Twice. For both of us. Yeah. And you want to make sure you do your best to the that hopefully that shit doesn't happen again. Or at least that you're somewhat I, you can't, I, it's funny because someone say, how do you, you, uh, you can't, pre- even, even right now, if, if I had to go back in time to that moment with the knowledge I have now, I still wouldn't be prepared for that. Shit. You can't be prepared for that. Shit. The only thing I, if I went back to that moment, the only thing I would think about is that I smoke cigarettes. So I'd be happy to rip open a pack of fucking <laughs> camel lights. <laughs> That's how I fucking rip a camel light. That's how good cigarettes are. <laughs> the only thing when you go back to your trauma that you're like, I'd fucking smoke a cigarette. I'll tell you that much. I, uh, one of the things, there was this very fascinating interview with Stephen Colbert that I read. And Stephen Colbert lost his father and his brother in a plane accident. I just recently learned that, too. Yeah, I didn't know that. And Martin Short lost. It was a, it was a Rolling Stone article about Martin Short. And Martin Short lost both of his parents when he was a teenager. Like, I didn't know that. And not, I, I, I don't want to speak incorrectly, but I, I don't believe it was simultaneously. I believe it was a one-two punch the way we've gone through. Where it's kind of like, wham, like a setup, and you're like, what? Well, oh, fuck. Yeah. And it's just coming back. Um, but something really interesting Martin Short quoted Stephen Colbert as saying, just because you're fireproof doesn't mean you're not afraid of fire. So it's like, you go through that and you come out tough as fuck, man. Like, I've made a joke that if my child ever says they want to be a comedian, I'm going to go in the next room, get a gun, walk in in front of them, and go be funny and fucking blow my brains out. Because it's just like, you just fucking. I already told my daughter yeah, she's not yeah. allowed to be a comic. Because it is, man. It's like, <laughs> I, I got misquoted in an article that, I, that really fucking pisses me off because uh, I've been saying that I think recently comedy has became gentrified by people with non-comedic sensibilities. There's a lot of people in comedy that they don't want this life. They, they see it on Instagram and they see the full theaters and they see the full, they see people doing shit and they're like, I want to be a comedian. But it's like, we all have that reason that we have to do it. And a lot of the times comedy was the first place I met people like you where it was like, yeah. Oh, your dad's dead. My right. dad's dead. No one in school related to me. You know, yes. My, one of my best friends growing up, Dennis, his dad died. And that was the thing where it was in inv- It was so fucking beyond valuable to me to have someone to be like, yo man, uh, Father's Day sucks. And like, fuck it, let's drive around and smoke a blunt. We'll just talk about our dads. And you're like, I would love to. And you don't realize that like, it makes you feel more. My therapist says you gotta let it in because you gotta let the bad in because that's how you let the good in. Mm-hmm. It's all gotta come in. I love Alan Watts. I love the book on the taboo of knowing yourself. And he explains that it, this is all one thing. The good is connected to the bad. Yeah. And it's all... 
And you have to understand both of them. You have to. Yes. And and I uh, say all the time, you got to sometimes you have to sit in your shit for a little bit and understand what's going on around. You take stock in how bad this is and what it looks like and, and what it feels like, like. And then get the fuck up. And yeah. Move on and don't forget that because it's going to come back, like I said, at the deli fucking counter. Exactly. Crying. One of the things fucking was Thanksgiving, for Christ's sake. I was, yeah, I always was worried about people being mad at me for a long time. I was really worried about that. My 20s, I was obsessed. Like, my therapist said I wanted to be liked. It was just like this thing where, like, I want you to like me. Don't be mad at me. Because I feel like if you're mad at me, you'll leave and I'll be alone or whatever. And then my therapist was like, why are you worried about being alone? You were completely alone from one to 10. And then you met your sister and then you had her and then you lost her. So the worst has happened. You've been completely alone with alcoholic parents where you have no clue how people are acting. When you're raised by alcoholic parents, man, especially like my mom got control of her drinking, but there was a moment there where it was fucking oh, so mom and dad were both out yeah 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 okay. but there was a moment where it was real fucking dicey and when you're a child and you're alone with that you don't know what you're getting you don't it's not mom on a saturday that's like hey did you do your chores i'm gonna make eggs you know it's like mom on a thursday night like why the fuck are you doing bad at school and you're like where the fuck why didn't you fucking help me set the table and you're like the fuck? so i i got that on top of all this shit but then you start to realize, man, like, you're good. You, you've been through all the bad shit. So now I don't give a fuck. Now I can have real relationships. And I feel bad because there's a lot of lonely people in this world. And they listen to podcasts and they listen to radio shows and they become attached to people. And it's not a real relationship. It's something that they project because they're lonely and they don't want to deal with the fact that they're lonely. But that's how you get over it is you sit in it and you go, I'm that's completely right. alone and that's okay. And I started noticing when I stopped chasing the women that I thought I was supposed to be with, when I stopped chasing the, the fans that I thought I was supposed to have or the person I was supposed to be, <clears throat> then the real me just comes out and you're like, oh man, great shit starts happening. Because you start being like, oh fuck, I, I'm, I came out of my shell and it's not hailing. Right. It's not. It's actually a nice day. Yes. Hail might come, but I got the shell. Mm -hmm. uh, the shell's built. I can go back in the shell if yep. I need it. But stop stop living in the shell and start realizing you can go back to the shell. You're, you'll be okay. I'm going to lose my grandmother. That was a very hard trip for me, this this Thanksgiving trip. Because I really saw my grandmother and her I saw her mortality. I saw she's 92 years old. Yeah, Dude, she, I'm doing a joke about it now, but uh, she slept in two days in a row, and I was like about to call cousins. <laughs> I was about to be like, let's fuck it. <laughs> Y'all need to get up. Yeah, yeah, you guys got to get up to San Francisco. Some shit fucking went down. You know, I was like, she, she time it out. But then it's like, but then it's like, I'm going to lose her. I'm going to lose my mom. And I losing my mom, I thought about it. It's going to fucking wreck me. But guess what? I'm also hopefully going to have children and bring new life into this world. That's it. And I'm going to have new friends. And then you're going to have new anxiety. And new shit. anxiety. By the way, once you have those kids, it starts bringing... Because like you, you said, I wish I could have talked to my dad about being a parent. Yeah. You know, like, how the fuck do you deal with this? You had yeah. twins. I'm a twin. Like, you had twins? How the fuck do you do that? Dude, but there's also this, like... Um, just because <laughs> something brings you anxiety doesn't mean you should avoid it. Mm -mm. If anything, that means you should learn how to deal with it. I always like, like, have you ever, I, I've been in arguments with people. I've, I've had problems with people and I've just thought about it. It's like, here's what I'm gonna fucking say to them. And here's, here's what I'm gonna get back at them and fucking show them that they're wrong or whatever. And then they'll apologize or they'll clear up and you'll be like, oh, I didn't think that was gonna clear up like that. But then there's a new problem. And then you go back to being like, I wish I had that old problem. Mm -hmm. because you know that old problem fixes itself. Well, guess what? The new problem is going to fix itself. But then there's going to be a new problem. There's always going to be something. That's what life is. That's it. I feel like th there's, a, there's something to be said about embracing challenges in your life. Like, I did this HBO special, and there was two weeks where I creatively was like, I guess that's it, man. I guess that's just all the comedy I'm doing, because I love that hour I put out. I love that HBO special hour, because I bust my ass on it. Guess that's it. Two weeks later, I'm like, oh, that's a funny joke. Oh, shit. And you go on stage, you're like, oh, fuck. You know what? I'm wrong. Now I got. 
I have more to say. And hopefully in 2022, the next special, whenever that comes out, I'll be like, oh, fuck, this was, this, that makes my HBO special. There's a, there's a progression. Yeah. There's always a progression because life is a progression. You got to keep evolving. And I think there's, there's a lot to be said about uh, sitting in your failures and sitting in, in your pain and, and, and learning that, like, my mom always says it, man. My mom's one of the strongest people I know, but she always says, this too shall pass. Like, this too shall pass. So, like, I remember sitting there finding out Michelle was dead. And mm. it felt that weekend. Where were you? Can you, do you mind telling us, walking us through that? Yeah, man. So, here's the full story. Here's a, when my dad died, I was sleeping over at McDaniel's house. Okay. Uh, shout out 49ers. <laughs> I hope this comes out in the playoffs. I hope we're doing well. It's coming out January. Go Niners. Probably going to be playing you again. Woo! Ravens Niners Super Bowl. Oh, Let's fucking it. do it. it. Oh, God. I love fucking it. That'll love the Niners. That would be a good one. That would be a good one. Um, so I'm spending the night at McDaniel's house, as I always did. It was December 13th, and I came home. And my mom was like, sit down. And just the look on her face. I was like, Dad died. She you said like, that. Yeah, it's cirrhosis, man. I saw him for the last time Thanksgiving. And, Thanksgiving in 97 was the last time I saw him. Okay. And I walked in that room and I saw my dad and I was like, you're done. It was, it was heartbreaking. Like, he looked like a 95-year-old man. I was like, you're, you're dead. He's a dead man walking. So when I came home that day from sleeping over at McDaniel's house, my mom said I need to speak to you. She had that face and I was like, my dad died. Fuck. Okay. And we sat there, you know. It was that was the worst situation. That was worse than than Michelle dying because did you cry when you found out your dad out of that moment? No, in, in neither did moment you, did I cry. When I, did you cry for your dad? By myself, alone. So later that day, yeah, dude, we or, we could do a fucking three hour podcast because my mom was dating my godfather, who was my dad's ex best friend, who hated my dad. Oof. So and they were. They would, their drinking would fuel each other. They were having fucking pint glasses of screwdrivers. Like, fucking come get some. Damn. They were getting loose in Aurora. He hated my dad. And so when my dad died, wasn't a lot of sympathy in the house. It was more like, ah, that fucking loser died. But that loser was my guy. Yeah. I loved my dad. My dad was the shit. Yeah. My dad was super funny, very charming, very nice guy. Just had a real bad drinking problem and was a shitty dad. Um, so that felt weird because I didn't have the sympathy that I needed. I needed them to be like, are you cool? Right. It's a, it's a major wound. You got to treat that shit like I got shot. Right. But they didn't. I was walking around the house like Antonio Banderas and Desperado. <laughs> There's fucking trailing blood oh, against the wall. <laughs> it's against the white wall. I'll like, just keep my hand over this bullet. And, 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 and you go, oh, and, 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 yeah, it was, it was fucked up. And then um, we played a high school football game. Um, my junior year, and we slept over at my friend Zach's house. We drank beers and slept over at my friend's my friend's house. And um, I came over. I came home that Saturday morning, and my mom, her boyfriend was moving out. Joe was moving out. He was getting out. So this is supposed to be fucking mission yeah, accomplished. Right. We got the fucking. Yeah. We got the insurgents out. And I come home. And my mom's got that same look on her face. And she's like, I got to talk to you. And immediately I'm like, did Nana die? And she's like, no. And I was like, Aunt Karen, who's my dad's sister, who's like my second mom. And she's like, and she just starts crying. And she was like, it was Michelle. This is her daughter. No, it was her stepdaughter. Her stepdaughter, okay. But she knew yeah, what, and my sister. mom loved my sister. Yeah. My mom, as as far as stepdaughters and stepmom, she wasn't ever really her stepmom. Right. Because she was grown. By the time she started coming around my life, she was like 22, 21, 22. You know, I was like 10 years old when my sister started really being involved in my life. And I just remember that face. And she was like, it's Michelle. And I just remember getting up from the couch and walking. Oh. Like down the hallway. And then like, kind of falling and then being like get the fuck up and then just being like I, just walking upstairs to my room and my mom was like hey hey hey, hey you know and then i was like i gotta take a drive because i had a car and i went and i went to my friend zach's dad's house frank frank the tank and big notre dame fans and they were watching notre dame navy and it was fall. It was, it was October 30th. All gold 30th. helmets in that game. Yeah, all gold helmets. Yeah. And it was uh, 
the leaves were all on the ground, and I sat on the front of Zach's blazer with him, and we smoked a half a pack of Marlboro Lights. And I just remember sitting there being like, what the fuck? Hey. Your mom's had to tell her son yeah. that his father and, and his sister. sister both were dead in two in the two four-year span? Two years. Two years span. Yeah. Jesus Christ. A little under two years. Fuck. Yo, but then I hang out with my grandmother. Both of her kids are dead. And her granddaughter. 92. That's the other thing. I I said this to you outside because I had a a fan recently reach out to me. And I I said, I want to be something my father never was. And and that's an old man. But that's the thing. You wish for certain things. But you get to be 92, you could outlive your kids. You know? And that's that's a frightening thing. And you could outlive a granddaughter. Yeah. So what's crazy about that is something that that we said that, um, you know, you were saying. We were talking about being old because I said my sister died when she was 28. And so when I turned 29. That was kind of a weird year for me because I'm like, I'm older than Michelle was right. when she died. The thing about my dad dying, because you're older than your dad now. I am now, yeah. The That's math weird. that really fucked me up, the math that really fucked me up, same year as, as when I counted the Michelle years that I was 28. The math that really hurt me was when I was 29, that was 15 years my dad was dead, which means... He had been dead longer than, than he, he had been alive. alive. I was with you on that math too. And I that was, was doing like, the same thing. I was like, wait. He's been gone longer than he was around. Yes. And that's the kick in the dick. Yeah. That's when you're like, come on, man. Come on. I'm supposed to be like 70 and being like, oh, my yeah. dad's been gone longer than he was around. I'm fucking 29 and being like, oh, yeah, dad's been gone longer than he was around. It's just weird as it's fuck. It's so weird. It's I, I said I, I don't I don't know if I'll ever feel I could live to be a hundred. I don't know if I'll ever feel older than my dad. I, I, think I just will. this feeling inside you, you know. It's not Dude, about see, a number. I, my dad had a mustache. Mm-hmm. Just a fucking that hunted banger. A mustache. Just a and banger of a bartender Man. mustache. Just a great one. And you know, he was thirty four when he had me. I see thirty four year olds with mustaches. I'm like, clean your fucking life. <laughs> Clean your fucking life up, dude. What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Get your shit together, dude. So you went, I know we got an 11 no, no, 11. I can, do, I can do this podcast for seven fucking hours. That is my grandmother's address right there, 11 hey. 11. That's unbelievable. Dude. I got that. I, so I went back to Baltimore one time and I went to her old house and it like I was drinking with a buddy. And at two in the morning, I went and took one of those old, you know, those military shovels where you can yeah. the head and yeah, the yeah. yeah. I went and pulled that shit out of the fucking brick. And stole it off that damn house. And I have it in my house above my door. I repainted it and made Come it nice on. looking. It's 1111 was her address. And I, I still gr- drive by. And on where the... I don't know why these people did it. But they, they didn't put it right over the old one. They put it right next to it. So you could still see... Where you fucking yeah, carved, it carved it but out. But that's that fucking... That's what's up. <laughs> <laughs> that's great as fuck. Yeah, dude. That's like... There's certain things you got to hold on to. I have my dad's Niners jacket. The 80s Sheen one. It's the still starter. Yo, dude, the old, the, the with the gold, pack, with the 49er yeah. gold sheen one that are back now. They came mm, back yeah, like five years back. ago. Yeah. But yo, the crazy shit about it is it's in my closet in my apartment. You can still smell the Marlboro Reds. You can still smell the fucking cigarettes that he smoked. Just talking shit about Steve Young, Jerry Rice. Not talking shit, talking shit yeah. probably about fucking Jim Everett. In the fucking lowly Rams, <laughs> <laughs> in the fucking Falcons, who were in the NFC West in the '90s, which made no sense. But it is, um, yeah, man. That math, you start doing that math, and it's uh, if it trips you out, yeah, it's a bummer, dude. It's a fucking bummer. But um, like I said, man, you go through that, and when you get through that, if someone's going through that, and they're listening to this. Know that the thing that always helps me, eat when I'm sick, when I'm upset, if I got someone that's bugging me. You got a crazy fan. If you got something fucking you up, just know in the future you'll be past that. Oh, yeah. And you'll look back to it and be like. You might not even remember some of it. I guarantee you won't remember most of it. It's so much bigger at the time than anything really fucking is. But that being said, learn how to be in it when you're in it. Right. I'm trying to do that right now with this HBO special. I'm trying to enjoy the fact that I... I, I got an HBO special. Dude. Crazy to me, man. Crazy. 16 year old me. I was going to say 16 year old me is watching Dave Chappelle's killing him softly, realizing he wants to be a stand up comedian. 
16 years old. I loved comedy my whole life. My dad and I bonded over Dangerfield, yeah. over Robin Williams, over SNL, over Eddie Murphy, over Pryor, Carlin. And then to see Chappelle at 16 yeah. changed my life, changed my fucking life. And it made me want to be a comedian. But at 16, I needed that thing. I needed that thing to look at and be like, fuck all this. I want to see that Sesame Street bit again. You know, like, fuck all this shit. I want to see... George Bush offering a second day. Sign the treaty, baby. Uh, <laughs> there's just so much. There's. It's like, now I'm trying to learn. I got a girlfriend that I'm crazy about. I got friends that I love and respect. I fucking can take care of my mom. I can take care of my grandma. I'm trying to enjoy all that, dude. Yeah, Niners dude. are fucking 10 and 2 at team. the moment. Hopefully in the playoffs in the future. But... You know what I mean? I got a, I got my fucking middle school best friend is calling That's plays. Nuts. What are we doing here? Yeah. And I'm gonna be worried that my phone doesn't charge right. Right. And look at all and see, here's the other thing that we have that the dead people don't is hindsight. Like, look at all the cool your dad would shit himself right yeah, now man. to talk to your best friend about what, Yo, my what dad, kind of plays you? What, what's this right here? Well, he probably my, would be in there watching fi uh, film tape. With my him. dad would shit on the film fact tape, that tape. I'm on first name basis with the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers. Yes. I know Kyle. He was, Probably more than your HBO special. Yeah, like, <laughs> you, I guarantee, <laughs> yeah. he'd be like, HBO, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, you sit great. in the office? <laughs> you go in the office when you go to games? I'm like, yeah, I was in, I was in the wedding party with Kyle. And he's like, what? That is you nice. know? And you think like, yeah, I sit there and be like, hey, Fuck the Seahawks. I'm like, yeah, fuck the Seahawks. That's yeah. why I want to stick around. I want to see what my kids fucking do. Yo, man, that's... I, I really... Took... I've, I've been thinking about that a lot, and I, I'm like... I definitely always knew I wanted to be a dad, but um, but now when you think about that, it's like, I definitely want to... Um, yeah, have a fan. I want to continue on. I want to continue on to be... To keep evolving. To keep growing. Because, I mean, dude, think about you before your daughter, and now think about you... With a five-year-old. Yeah. How cool is Christmas now? Right. It's the best. Because you get to fucking the blow best. that girl's mind. Yep. You get to blow your little girl's mind to be like, hey, we got Elf on a Shelf, and you're just doing shit that maybe 27-year-old Ryan Sickler's like, this is fucking dumb. Yeah, this is fucking stupid. This is fucking stupid, yeah. dude. I ain't fucking doing this. And then now you're like, where's the Elf on the Shelf? Uh, we like, don't do, I don't do Elf on the Shelf. <laughs> You know, That's gonna, little, that'll kill you. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah all right. Yourself. You're like, dude, come on. I'm Just not that little motherfucker sits not, and watches. Yeah, 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 he I'm doesn't not move. Cool. Yeah, that, There's a lot of rules with Elf. They on call the shelf. that cuck on a shelf. <laughs> <laughs> He's, just trying That's to enjoy, my He's trying to enjoy Christmas. I just, um, so I was saying, so my stepson, his name's Derek. Yeah. I took him to uh, the Ravens Rams game. I've become uh, friends with Orlando Brown, the tackle for the Ravens, who's a fucking awesome dude. Yeah. And his story is just incredible. I can't wait to have him here because his story is unbelievable. Yeah, and you're telling me before the show, and it's fucking unbelievable. It's nuts. He's a yeah. Maryland kid that that got drafted. His dad played for the Ravens, got drafted by the Ravens. His dad was well, dad passed. He gets drafted by the Ravens. Where's his dad's number? Plays his dad's position, and they have some of his dad's old come equipment. Come on, man. I mean, come on. Come on. It's unbelievable. So I can't wait to have him on. But he gave us tickets. Thank you, Zeus. And we went, Tom Segura, my, uh, Derek and I all went, and then we went and met him after. And I'm telling Derek, like, I'm looking at this 16-year-old kid, like, at 16, you look like a baby. This was me. Yeah. This was who I yeah. was with yeah. no dad or anything around. And I'm telling him, like, take pictures of this shit, remember this shit, because when I was 16, we didn't do anything like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you didn't think like no, that. No, we. I mean, but nobody knew anybody. You know, we yeah. just you'd go to the game, watch the game, whatever, and that was it. So... Like all these added things that that come with having a family and seeing what they do and everything, yeah, it's, it's pretty fucking awesome, yeah. It's unbelievable, man. I appreciate you having me on, dude. Dude, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I want you to real quick. We're gonna start a new segment here. We're gonna do a new segment called "Dear Sixteen Year Old Me." You can yeah, look right at your camera all there. Right. What give advice to your and it could be when you're sixteen. You could be look, look when you're forty, invest in app, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But whatever you want, please. I would say sixteen year old me. Two things. Enjoy those cigarettes before you quit because they're fucking sweet. Have one for me right now. Just go outside and light one up in the backyard and just fucking throw the tennis ball for Montana. Uh, number two, get into therapy, man. Asking for help doesn't mean you're weak. It means you need help. And I think 16-year-old me needed to hear that.
I think so too, dude. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for dude, coming on. This has been fantastic. You're the fucking I man, dude. It. I appreciate you uh, having promote me. Promote one more time. Plug HBO everything. special, Son of a Gary on HBO Now, HBO Go. Fucking please go stream it. Uh, hope you enjoy it. Dansoder.com for live dates. Uh, at Dan Soder on social media and listen to the bonfire Monday through Thursday, 6 to 8 p.m. Myself and Big J Okerson, Comedy Central Radio. It's the shit. Uh, you're the shit. Thanks for having me. You're the shit. Thank you. On, uh, Dude. Congrats on all your success. Thanks, man. Uh, as always, Ryan Sickler on all social media, ryansickler.com. We'll talk to you all next week. Mm-hmm.